Welcome to Booktopia TV. I'm here with AC Grayling, author of his new book, Friendship um, and the God Argument, which we came out in March, and uh, my personal favourite, which is Towards the Light, um, which is a, a marvellous book. I got up and applauded as I read it. Um, uh, we're here to talk about friendship, uh, but we'll discuss many different subjects as we go through. Welcome, AC Grayling. It's my pleasure. It's lovely to be here. Um, I'm reading Friendship at the moment, and um, I've wandered through um, Plato and Aristotle and their um, discussions about what it means um, to what friendship actually means. Uh, to see it broken down, uh, I started examining my own friendships and, and asking, uh, do they fit those criteria? And you are leading me as we go through the history of, of friendship, and I feel that there, um, as we go through, and people like Hume and Kant come through, there'll be battles and disagreements about what it means to be friend, uh, have, have friendship in your life. Now, my question is, what does it mean to you? Um, what's friendship mean to you? Having done all this research into friendship and then probably reflected on your own friendships, uh, what, does it, what does it take to have a good friendship? I, I found actually working on the book that uh, when I came to the third part of the book, which was discussing contemporary views about friendship, and you know, there are these complications now, people have so many friends on Facebook, do we still mean the same thing by it? In the last 150 years, or perhaps uh, less, um, the, the whole landscape of, of human relationships, at least in the more developed uh, countries of the world, has changed because men and women can be friends without uh, necessarily there being other complications. There can be friendships across ethnic divides, across age ranges, and so the, the landscape has changed. But one thing that struck me was that the core thing about friendship the need that we have as essentially social beings, to, to have in our lives people we can trust, people we tremendously like, people with whom we feel comfortable, um, people who meet certain needs and we feel that we meet certain needs that they have for uh, companionship in them, remains a constant. And I was tremendously struck, looking back at the uh, legendary and uh, literary friendships um, so richly present in our culture, all the way back to, to Homer and beyond, and um, how little has changed in this fundamental need that we have for that kind of connection, elective connection, chosen other people in our lives. And if anybody thinks that um, we should be relativistic about you know, the past, that we don't really understand what it was like to be somebody who lived in passive antiquity, let's say, they should read Homer, they should read about Achilles' grief at the loss of his friend Patroclus, and they will see that they are in very, very familiar territory. Yes, I wonder I was reading the um Especially some of the later essays uh, that you referred to, um, the Montaigne, um, where he's describing friendship, and um, and even back with with um, Homer and Socrates, um, their discussions of friendship, you get a real sense that this is something that's been around for for a long time and it has not changed that that much. Um, some of the reasons for it had, and some of the uh, justifications or the, the I suppose the the philosophy behind it has, has changed, but the core thing which they're trying to describe, trying to get the nut out, is, is uh, right through. It's very familiar to us, isn't it? We, we feel that we understand completely what it is that they're on about. Um, it's quite interesting that the, the way that friendships are mediated, that is, you know, I think several centuries ago, in order to visit a friend you haven't seen for a long time, you might have to travel a great distance, or if you wrote to them, it would be days or weeks before you heard back. Uh, now everything will be done at the speed of light and it's instant and you can have a friend on the other side of the world, you can email them or Facebook them. Um, but, but that doesn't change uh, the, the nature. It's not a difference of kind, it's just a difference of degree in the, in the way that communication between friends is potentiated. Um, and I, I wanted to try to bring out this fact that there is something very deep but very constant uh, about those aspects of our human nature which um, we need to pay attention to and think about uh, for exactly the reason that the philosophical tradition has thought about friendship itself. I mean, you know, when I told my friends that I was writing a book about friendship, they all thought I'd finally lost it, you know, and I was, I was just getting into the patient strong category of self-help. But I pointed out to them, this debate started with Aristotle. In the Nicomachean Ethics, there are these two wonderful chapters in which he discusses friendship as one of the central amenities of the good and well-lived life. A, a really flourishing, rich human existence is one which is complemented by, by real friendships. And he wanted to discuss the different kinds of relationships that people have with one another and to say something about this most achieved of relationships, which, which friendship is. 
And then his influence on the debate has been massive. So there's a great literature all through antiquity, all through the medieval and Renaissance periods, right up into the Enlightenment and beyond, where people just iterate the points that Aristotle made. And this is a pity. Aristotle was a great man with a great mind, but he got one thing wrong about friendship. In fact, it was a throwaway remark by him where he said, a friend is another self. And this is repeated and repeated and repeated. And it's wrong. Because allowing your friends to be different, allowing that there's a complementarity between you, allowing them the space to, to, to be themselves in your friendship with them is very, very important, even if you share a great deal in the way of sense of humor and interest and what you love in the way of sports and books and things. Um, that would be very important, but, but the difference is important too. So I, I prefer the definition given by that great philosopher Oscar Wilde, who, by the way, was always very, very insightful. And he said, a friend is the, a person who stabs you in the front. And that's absolutely right. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Um, I, I think of the book as a, as a bit of a warning as well towards um, to, to modern society with Facebook and, and, and how rap rapidity of communication um, that a friend, friendship is something that you work towards and that, that you uh, have to be mature about. That idea um, that it's another self is a very immature idea. You need to be more mature than that and be able to accept people's differences and to be able to, to cope with that. Um, and we do live in a time where you can unfriend someone in a split second. Um, so they just disagree with you. But some of the one, my, 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 my most wonderful friends disagree with nearly everything I say. Um, and we have wonderful arguments. And, and, um, and that temptation to rid them um, with, a, with an unlike um, is there, but um, I would be I would be much um, much saddened if I was to lose those sort of relationships. Oh, I think you're right. But you, you make a very very good point, and it's a very important point. This one that uh, at times a good friend will be good just in so far as he or she challenges you over certain things. I mean, there are these moral dilemmas about uh, the loyalty that we feel towards friends and. Uh, our sense of obligation to them. So if a friend does something wrong and we are tempted to abet them or protect them or uh, you know, tell them that it was okay that they did the wrong thing, may, may not be the right act of friendship. It may be that sometimes we, we do have to chat to them, although on the whole um, you know, we would prefer to be loyal to our friends. I think the, the, the really key thing here is, and, and you bring it up in saying you know, you've got these people who do disagree with you, and then that's a really healthy thing. But, but the key thing is to, is to know when our friends merit us telling them the truth, and we know when we should tell them the comfortable lie, uh, out of kindness or of love for them. Yeah. Um, now, one of the books you published, or the book you published earlier in the year, um, The God I, uh, I've been reading uh, alongside reading friendship, and it's um, the clarity of thought in both books, I try, I try just to admire, um, being able to take an idea, strip it off of, of the unnecessary um, uh, distractions and just find that core. Um, I, I think uh, I've read quite a few books that deal with Christianity and religion, um, Dawkins and Hitchens and, and, and the like, um, but I've never come across someone that, that was able to lay these, these ideas so bare and to argue them so clearly um, and to, to, to really take away all the, all the complications of the thought and just see it as it is. Um, and so at the beginning of um, the God argument, um, you, you argue the case against religion. And, and that, it's that half of the book which, which is, um, it races through and it, it demolishes, in my mind, many, many different arguments for religion and for, for God and, and, and its need in our life. Um, but what I love about this book is the second half. Um, what I don't get in a lot of the arguments is, OK, you've taken away our God and our religion. Uh, you're saying we don't need those. But if we're all going to go to ruin, rack and ruin if we don't have that, what can we do? In the second half of the book, you answer that we've been doing it forever. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been very bright people leading the way and helping us through making our moral decisions and ethical decisions. Um, that, that point, uh, which, which I, I think is um, uh, so refreshing, uh, how important is it, is it to you is, is read by, by believers? Or is it, is it a book that is read by people who are, uh, are looking who are no longer believers, but are looking for, for something to believe in. Well, I th th thank you for, for saying what you do about the second half of the book, because it, it is a, a sort of a passion, really, to try to alert people to the fact that if they didn't know it already, that we have this, this uh, great tradition. And I mean, it goes right the way back, indeed, to, to Aristotle and to uh, 
uh, Socrates, the, a great tradition of what you might call humanist thought. So it's a thousand years older than, than Christianity, at least from the point of view of Christianity's dominance of the, the mind of Europe and beyond. Um, and it's a very, very rich, deep, very humane tradition. It's not a, a doctrine, it's not a teaching, it's not a set of prescriptions, do's or don'ts. It's an attitude. And the attitude is, we have to think for ourselves and we've got to make choices about our values and, and how we live. Um, and our starting point, when we, we recognize, and this is where the book connects a bit with the friendship book too, because it's about um, what sort of people we should be, how we should live, what, what, what a worthwhile life is like. Uh, and, and friendship is central to that. But in asking those questions and thinking about them, we have to have a starting point. And the humanist starting point is to try to think of others and ourselves and our relationships with them in the most generous, the most humane, the most sympathetic way. Because it's not always easy life. It's, there are dark patches in life and, and we struggle with ourselves and, and with others and things do go wrong. But there's also a huge amount of, of potential for, for joy and flourishing in life too. And so a, a sympathetic understanding and a generous understanding of human nature and the human condition. Now, it's very easy to say those two things, but we are still struggling to understand human nature. Mm. The human condition is explored by philosophy, by history, by literature. Perhaps one of the richest resources for, for thinking about the human condition is indeed literature. And so to be a, a reflective, attentive reader, to listen to others, to get involved in the, in the great conversation that we have with ourselves about what it is to live and, and what's worth doing in life, that's what it is to be a humanist, trying, trying to... to uh, plough a path, to, to find a path in life accordant with one's own talents for living, uh, with one's own gifts for, for being a good friend, a good neighbour to others in the human story, trying also to be as sympathetic as one can um, to the huge diversity that there is in human experience. Other people will make choices that we can barely understand, but they may have a right to. You know, unless they overstep the mark and they do harm and they're cruel or unjust, that's a different story. But to begin with, we should give, as Emerson says, we should give any human being what we give a painting, and that is the advantage of a good light. So if you, if you see that as the premise of the, of the humanist endeavor, then, then you see we have to think, we've got to be alert, we've got to be open-eyed, we've got to be sympathetic, and we start from there and we try to build an ethical life that will be individual. One important assumption behind that is that there is many kinds of good lives as there are people to live them. There's not a one-size-fits-all, top-down model, which is what the religions have always said, or, or the political ideologies that communists have. They've all said that there's a one-size-fits-all model. But no, it's not true. We are very diverse. And human nature is very plural. Uh, and that's something that we have to understand and grapple with. And the endeavor uh, of doing that is itself the good life. It's not that you achieve it at some end point. It's the day-to-day -day endeavor to live according to that attitude. Uh, I totally agree with the, um, the good life being that served all that um, experience of all those different opinions and, and the examination of, of why we're doing stuff and why our friends are doing things and, and analysing um, our behaviour. Uh, we, don't, we don't always think reasonably, yeah. so you want to be able to and reflect on what you've done and the choices you've made. Um, I like that you're an advocate also of, of literature as, as, a, as a guide. Um, uh, people Books like Middlemarch and um, Tom Jones, but also uh, modern modern writers who are really tapping into um, how we do and why we do things now, and giving us a virtual walkthrough of certain um, problems that we may face later on. Um, but that that experience of these problems in those in those really clear, um, careful, considered um, uh, novels and, and descriptions that are that are sort of um, Experience that we don't have to. You know, we can, you know, better the writers are more more of an imprint as on us. Very much so. I mean, you know, when people study philosophy at university, for example, they do a course in ethics, and in that course they will look at certain examples, certain problem cases. If you think about it, literature is a, a an exploration in depth and in extenso of life situations in which people um, have to make difficult choices sometimes and uh, suffer disappointments and grief. And you know, we. You know, again, to, to quote the great Oscar Wilde, he, he said very, very insightful thing. He said, most people are other people, meaning most people's reactions to life, attitudes, what they do, what they feel, they learn from, from other people. This is true. We learn by observing our parents and, and, and 
people in our in our local environment as we grow up, we, we learn something about what it is to be a human being. And of course, literature, which is this this great examination of uh, the human story, of human stories in their immense variety, provides us, if we are very, very thoughtful readers, provides us with a huge stock of material on which to reflect. And we may sometimes meet people or encounter situations um, which are, are not part of our own personal experience, but if we hadn't been introduced to them or the possibility of them in literature, we might not even be able to recognize them and certainly not be able to sympathize with them. I always remember a story about uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who must always be mentioned, of course, by a philosopher. <laughs> and uh, the story is that his sister Hermione once said to him, Oh, Ludwig, she said, we can't make head or tail of you. You're such a difficult person. And nobody in the family understands what you're on about. And he said, you're like a person who looks out of the window and you see somebody walking in the street in a very odd way. And what you don't realize is he's struggling against a strong wind. He's trying to get down the street against this gale. But we all have gales blowing in the inner landscape of our lives. Other people do, and sometimes the things that they do we just can't comprehend and we makes us angry or makes us dismiss them. But if we remember that, that the wind might be blowing, you know, yeah. that makes us more sympathetic. Um, one of the things that uh, I enjoy about living in Australia right now is that I'm able to discuss these thoughts freely um, and openly and be putting it out into, into YouTube later on. Um, in your book, Towards the Light, you chronicle that development, the development of the freedom we have now to chat about anything, um, uh, and and how how dangerous um, it is if we do not understand that history. Um, I'd love to have that book within schools and have them um, study that, that development um, towards um, towards the freedoms that a lot of people take for granted. What was your inspiration? What what, what caused you? Was it was it the age of uh, you know the um, what do they call it, the, the war on terror and things mm -hmm. like that? that, that Yes, yes, very much so. I mean, I've been involved for quite a long time in a practical way with, uh, with human rights matters. Uh, I belong to a thing called the IHEU, which is a, uh, an NGO of the Human Rights Council of the UN in Geneva, and I've done some work there. I've been involved with, with um, human rights campaigns in connection with China and Iran after the Tiananmen Square business. Um, and I, it, it really became a, an anxiety that as the technologies of surveillance and uh, monitoring control as they were rolled out and followed the inevitable path of technologies, which is that because you have them, you make use of them without really thinking about that it's justified to do so. In parallel with the increasing problem in the world of terrorism, of organized crime, of mass migration. So a lot of Western governments, including the UK government, which you know traditionally said to be, in the UK tradition said to be a very liberal, open kind of country, have begun to do things like installing CCTV cameras in every public square. There are more per head in the UK than anywhere else in the world. Uh, be be uh, began monitoring um, mobile telephony and email traffic, all in the interest of keeping us safe, allegedly, mm -hmm. but creating an instrument which, if things went wrong, and you know, hark back to the fact that people in the Weimar Republic in 1928 couldn't guess what Germany would be like in 1935. So if you create an instrument where you could so easily close down people's freedom of expression, invade their privacy, limit their autonomy and their personal freedoms, uh, close down the newspapers, close down the opportunity for people to exchange information. But if you create such an instrument, you're, you're asking for trouble. Inefficiency uh, is a great protector of civil liberties. So the idea of having an ID card, a, a biometric ID card, uh, that anybody could have all the information on a little chip the size of a full stop implanted in your ear lobe or in the skin of your wrist, and then these were real ideas. These were ideas that were being sold to, to Western governments by um, big companies with the technological know-how to do it. It struck me as a serious threat. And I thought, we, we, we sleepwalk into these situations. We embrace all the wonderful new technology. We love email, we love our mobile phones, and we don't realize uh, the cost that we're paying to have them. And we wouldn't willingly give them up, but we should certainly be alert to the dangers attached to them. And which we've seen. I mean, it's you know, out in the public um, uh, space now about uh, the National Security Agency in the United States, um, about what uh, security services in Europe do in these ways. So it's this is not conspiracy theory. It's just trying to say to people, be vigilant. There is the old saying: the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. You have to be vigilant, thoughtful about these things. And so my thought was, if people only knew what a heck of a struggle it was to get these civil liberties and human rights. 
by how many people actually died on the street for them. It's like, it's like having the vote. And people are so careless about a vote. I mean, you're very civilized in Australia because you know, people have got a vote. And if they yeah. don't, they, they're going to be penalized. But I think that's brilliant because this is something, when you know, think about when South Africa first had one man, one vote, you know, back, back uh, after the snapping of apartheid, how people queued for hours and hours and hours in the hot sun to have that privilege. Uh, so it, 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 you, to, to know the development of these things in the history that lies behind them is to be fully aware of their importance. So I wanted to tell that story. I'm very glad you did. Um, thank you very much for talking with us. It's been a great pleasure. Um, I'd love to talk to you for hours and hours, but I don't think everyone's going to sit around and watch it. Um, it was, it was, I mean, I've got so many questions that I'd like to, to, to go on with, but um, uh, I can, all I can say is to the readers out there that there are a great number of books by A.C. Grayling available on booktopia.com.au. Um, his new book, Friendship, which you'll see behind me here, um, is, is definitely worth um, reading and it will make you um, look back on your own friendships and also maybe even help you um, define and, um, and experience greater friendships in the future. Um, his book, um, The God Argument, which is here, um, is an earth-shattering book. It's, it's brilliant, but it also offers a wonderful um, alternative and hands uh, many of the great thoughts back to humanity and gives us um, a greater freedom to think about our moral futures and our ethical futures. So uh, I highly recommend those books and all the others and I'm going to be gathering as many as I can. Uh, thank you again for, for joining thank us. Thank you very much for having me. And, uh, and uh, all those books are available on booktopia.com.au. Thank you.